quick. Name a game company started by former Capcom employees. Did you pick Platinum Games? Or Game Republic? Or maybe Crafts and Meister? Good choice. But if you want to go back much farther, you can check out a little developer that broke off from Capcom in the early 1990s. A developer called Ukiyote. They brought together Spielberg blockbusters. Tis true, Peter. Time does fly. Grim 1990s comics. I've got it. And, well, Hunky yeah. Skunk. Ukiyote took shape in 1991 after Osaka-based Capcom designer Kenshi Naruse left to found his own studio. Naruse had worked on several Capcom titles, but his last apparent gig there was designing Gargoyle's Quest. A spin-off of the Ghosts and Goblins series, Gargoyle's Quest was an impressive first-year title for the Nintendo Game Boy. It included both an RPG-like viewpoint and side-scrolling stages, and its hero Firebrand could cling to walls and fly at just about any point. Remember the flying, because Naruse and Ukiyote really liked that idea. Ukiyote started off by scoring a big name for their first creation, as Sony ImageSoft tapped them for a Super NES game based on the blockbuster movie Hook. Today, Hook is counted among Steven Spielberg's lesser films. It finds a grown-up lawyer, Peter Pan, returning to Neverland and rediscovering his true self with ham-fisted whimsy. In late 1991, however, it was everywhere, with action figures, Happy Meal toys, and a marketing campaign that made any child feel out of touch if they didn't see this new take on Peter Pan. Video games were a big part of that. Hook showed up everywhere, from arcades to the original Nintendo Entertainment System to the Amiga. Ukiyote's Hook was the most prominent, however. It appeared on the Super NES and was ported to the Sega Genesis and the Sega CD. It's the Super NES version that stands out the most. It's not hard to see the Capcom influence. The game has a bright, crisp look to it, with little details and exaggerations beyond what you might expect from a routine movie-based game. The slow, careful pace of the levels recalls the Ghosts and Goblins series, while Peter Pan's sword cuts in an arc much like the Cypher Blade of Strider. Yet it's Gargoyle's quest that influenced Hook the most. The flying mechanics work much the same way, though Peter is a little faster, and the rigidly challenging stages would fit right into the ghoul realm. Hook is perhaps too short and too stiff in the play mechanics, and today you have to wonder why Ukiyote didn't throw in some fancy Mode 7 flying levels similar to Pilot Wings. Even so, it lands above the usual movie-based games of the era, most of which couldn't even satisfy ardent fans of their source material, and people noticed back in 1992. Ads for Hook were full of high praise. And GamePro awarded the game a perfect row of exploding, super excited faces. True, GamePro gave out a lot of perfect scores, but rarely for games derived from movies. Unfortunately, the license doomed Ukiyote's Hook to obscurity. Hook was a hit film in late 1991, but it was one of those blockbusters that everyone in the world apparently saw once and then forgot about. The film was fading from the public eye, even as the games arrived in 1992. Ukiyote realized Hook's potential, however, and for their next game, they ventured into the risky land of original creations. 
released in 1993, Skyblazer follow in the traditions of Hook and Gargoyle's quest. Its hero, Sky, even looks a lot like Peter Pan as he leaps, swims, and soars about. Ukiyote also knew the Super NES hardware better by this point, and Skyblazer is filled with stunning effects, from rain-swept ruins to an armored cyclopean insect that grows until it fills the entire screen. The soundtrack comes from another notable Capcom expat, Harumi Fujita. Known as Mrs. Tarumi in the parlance of Capcom pseudonyms, she wrote music for everything from the US exclusive NES Strider, the ever popular Mega Man 3, and even the lesser known Willow NES game. Skyblazer's storyline is slim and unremarkable, with a hero named Sky rescuing a princess and saving his fantasy realm. Its most notable element is a localization that's competent for its day and includes an early line likely to make young players snicker. More intriguing is Skyblazer's use of names and imagery from Hinduism. The temples and statues give Skyblazer a subdued but undeniable unique look among 16-bit action games. The American version masks a lot of this though. By changing some of the names, and going with some pretty generic superhero box art. Poor Skyblazer also had the rotten luck to appear in North America less than a month after powerhouses like Mega Man X and Secret of Mana appeared. And a mega hit called Super Metroid showed up a few months later. All three would be highlights of the Super NES library and all three had storylines more elaborate than their predecessor. It signaled a slight but undeniable shift toward games with stronger narratives, and Skyblazer felt a little old-fashioned with a plot that's just as decorative and inconsequential as the background effects. The few positive reviews and a nice Nintendo Power spread couldn't earn the game much attention. It was an undiscovered gem of the Super NES library for years, and it was only in the modern era of collectors and retro appreciation that Skyblazer earned its due and became very expensive. Ukiyote's first attempt at an original game had faded quickly, but the developer wasn't finished. For their next big game, they landed another license, and a major one at that. Next time, we'll conclude the Ukiyote story as we explore their Super NES title Spawn, the Super NES turned PlayStation game Punky Skunk, their partnership with SNK, as well as their final years. Thank you for watching our first video. If you want to see more from us, you can help by liking our video and subscribing. Please also consider supporting us through Ko-Fi so we can bring you more videos.